Ryan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. Recently, Tom Husty interviewed me for his YouTube channel called The Unitarian Anabaptist. We talked about the importance of geography, archaeology, and Greco-Roman history for interpreting the Bible, especially the New Testament. Next, we delved into early church history, starting with the earliest forms of Jewish Christianity, which is a special interest to Husty, in the first and second centuries. We talked about the Jerusalem church, the Nazarenes, and the Ebionites. Next, we considered the persecution many Christians face at the hands of the Romans for their unwillingness to give their ultimate allegiance to Caesar, and got into the whole dynamics of that situation. The conversation was wide-ranging, but what came through over and over is the importance of studying the Bible in history in order to restore authentic Christianity and live it out today. Now, before getting to the interview, I want to tell you about an upcoming trip to Greece and Turkey that my friend Dr. Jerry Weirwell will be leading. I want to promo his trip on this episode because I talk about a recent trip I took and how important it is to learn about geography and archaeology when studying early Christianity. And I figured if I put this at the end, this episode is so long, (laughs) even for Restitutio, that many of you might not hear it. So anyhow, let me turn it over to Jerry. Hey everyone, Jerry Weirwell here. I want to tell you about an exciting opportunity coming up in the spring of 2024. Have you ever read the New Testament and wondered about the places or the cities that are mentioned? One cannot read, for example, the book of Acts without going on a vast adventure throughout the Mediterranean world. And that's exactly what we're going to do. From April 26th through May 11th, 2024, I'm going to be leading a Bible lands tour throughout Turkey and Greece called The Footsteps of Paul and John. This is going to be a 16-day tour with a two-day cruise across the Mediterranean from Turkey to Greece. We're going to go and visit many of the places, some of the most important places that are mentioned in the New Testament, places such as the seven churches of Revelation, the prominent cities that Paul wrote letters to like Ephesus, Thessalonica, Philippi, and Corinth. We're going to go to stand on the Areopagus in Athens. Athens, exactly where Paul gave his speech in Acts 17 about the altar to the unknown God. And we're going to walk the Via Ignatia, which is the very road that Paul walked on during his journey through northern Greece. And we're going to visit so many more places like this along the way. If you're interested in visiting the places that you read about in the New Testament and want to check out this tour, see the full itinerary in the link below. And if you have any questions, you can find my personal contact information in the tour link also provided in the show notes. This tour is being offered at a very reasonable rate of $46.59 per person. That is $4,659 per person, including airfare from Turkey and Greece, departing from the JFK airport in New York City. And this price also includes all lodging expenses, cruise ship expenses, service taxes and surcharges, breakfast and dinner every day, all ground transportation, gratuities, and entrance fees into the archaeological sites. I hope that you will consider joining us on this exciting trip in the footsteps of Paul and John this coming spring. Okay, back to the show. Here now is my interview with Tom Husty, or rather Tom Husty's interview with me. Episode 516, titled Restoring Authentic Christianity. John Finnegan, welcome to Unitarian Anabaptist. Thanks for having me. So this has been a long time in the waiting. I was interviewed by you about eight months ago, and now you're being interviewed by the Unitarian Anabaptist. What a privilege. I'm excited. This is a (laughs) wonderful platform. There is a lot that you have to say today in the limited time that we're going to do this. You just came back from a trip uh, of Italy and Greece. You finished a 500-year history of the early church. There's just uh, so much interrelated. And what I would like to do, as we discussed earlier, 
is to relate these things back to the first century faith of our early Christian brethren. So to begin, could you give us a summary of the important highlights that you saw on your trip related to church history? Yeah, we ended up going to a number of touristy spots in Greece, like Santorini and Mykonos, but uh, we also hit Athens, and we came in to the port of Piraeus and then got to the city of Athens. And, and the first thing that I will note, and anyone who's been to the Mediterranean in August will, will know what I'm about to say, is that it's hot. <laughs> <Okay>. It's a <laughs> very hot part of the world. Uh, yeah. And so is the Middle East. So it's, it's interesting that, you know, like times I've been to Israel, times I've been to Greece or Turkey, it is a very different climate than what I'm used to here in New York or you in sure. Ohio there. Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. And, uh, uh-huh. you know, that, that brings to mind the importance of water. Mm. And that's something that really stuck out to me in Israel. I would have never gotten that from reading books. But going to Israel, you go to these ancient sites and there are these cisterns dug into the ground, these huge caverns yes. Yes. to store water because it doesn't rain that much. Water is, is still a big deal in the first century in Rome, in other cities, Pompeii. I also got to visit Pompeii. Oh, wow. And uh, they brought the water in through aqueducts. And this is all part of their system of city structure. But the question is, who pays for the aqueducts? Who <laughs> pays for the bathhouses? You know, I got to see some bathhouses in Pompeii where you had the, the Frigidorium, the Tepidorium, and the Calidorium. You know, and this is the uh-huh. really cold water, the tepid water, and the hot water. And this is just what people did. These are, these are public facilities. This actually ended up uh, having a great deal of prestige as wealthy people stepped forward. And this happened in the first century, but also in the, the second century. It was really the heyday of this period where wealthy people would come forward and they would donate money to build these public works. And they would build other great structures like theaters and whatnot. And mm-hmm. these would then be the ones who controlled the cities and won political office. Okay. And uh, so it's a very different kind of world. You know, just like I don't think about water. I don't think about wealthy people building bathhouses or pools, <laughs> right? Yes. Uh, it's yes. just, we, you know, we pay taxes and then, you know, we argue about the politics. It's just a very different world. And that was really driven home to me on the trip. You know, in Athens, you're on the uh, Acropolis and you're seeing the Parthenon and uh, some of the other structures that still remain. And it's just like, this is an utterly different world. And it's just so helpful to remember that, Tom, because we don't do that when we read the Bible. What we do is we just, we have what we understand the world to be, and then we encounter the scripture, we read the text, and then we think to ourselves, how can I incorporate this new information I'm reading about the book of Acts or one of the church epistles, for example? How do I incorporate that into what I know about the world? This is an automatic process. And the problem is, if you don't force yourself to stop and say, wait, they lived in a different world. They had different... (laughs) different language, different politics, different weather, different everything, then you can easily misunderstand so much of the New Testament. I think that's a lot of what we as pastors do is we're trying to help people understand the scriptures. So uh, the trip was really enlightening in that sense. Also, I'll make another quick point about it is that we did manage to go to the very edge of Mount Vesuvius. Now, Mount Vesuvius blew in 79, A.D. 79, and that's what killed all the people in Pompeii and Herculaneum. And so they say it's still an active volcano, but you can take a bus (laughs) all the way up to the top, and then you hike until you get to the very crater, and you can look down into the crater, and uh, it's just incredible. Uh, It's just dirt and some, like, grass and stuff there's no like lava or anything cool but okay it's just uh an, a weird experience to like stand on the edge yeah. of an active volcano and think wow this thing blew 
And you can kind of see why ancient people were like, oh, the gods are angry, right? Because, like, uh-huh. who would... Have, well, yeah. There's no one in living memory of seeing this thing blow the last time, and it's just such an otherworldly power. Sure. How far is Pompeii from Rome? I think about two hours, if I had to oh, guess. that far. Something okay. like that. So we approach Pompeii from Naples. Uh, Naples is on the coast. Came at it from the west to get to Pompeii in the east. And then you get to Vesuvius, and at the top of Vesuvius, you can see everything. You can see oh, just wow. miles and miles in different cities, and it's really incredible. My, oh, my. So how far did the lava have to travel to make it to Pompeii? From well, it wasn't, it, they didn't get buried in lava, actually. No? Uh, yeah, you, you would, I guess you would expect that. But it was, it was a, uh, I think it was a toxic gas. Okay. That swept through, well, initially it was... Uh, was launching projectiles and ash and rock straight up, and huh. then that fell because of the wind onto the city. And so, there, you know, imagine like a hailstorm, but with stones. Okay. And bigger ones and smaller ones. But then a gas came from the mountain, and uh, I believe that's what happened, and it killed the people. But then it continued to rain ash. I think they said like 20 feet of ash. Something oh, wow. crazy. Okay. And it just settled on the city and people just didn't have a reason to go there for anything or i'm I'm not really sure why but it just laid there century after century and uh, i'm not sure exactly when maybe in the 1700s 1800s something something around there they're just like hey i think we found a city over here (laughs) you know archaeology just finally gets started and what happened tom is they would come against these air pockets so they're digging through and they hit like a pocket of air, and they're like, this is so weird. What is this? And someone got the bright idea of, of squeezing into it some plaster. Plaster? Plaster, yeah. okay. Yeah, have you, okay. have you seen these images? Yeah, I have, yeah, that's yeah. what I was wondering. Yeah, and okay. so then uh, they let it dry and harden, and then uh-huh. they chip around it, and then they see the exact shape of a human being. Yeah. He, sometimes even with fine detail of like facial expressions and stuff. Wow. That's kind of become their custom is when they hit an air cavity, they just do that. And there, there are lots of these casts of human beings in various positions. And what's crazy about them is it's just like a plaster, but inside the plaster are the, that person's actual bones. Yeah, I was going to ask. <laughs> okay, I was going to ask. You know, something that you mentioned to me back in Louisville, Kentucky, was the length of time that bones exist. Yeah. And we were talking about resurrection and uh, literal resurrection. And you mentioned that bones last a long time. That's something I really was impressed by. Something that Rabbi Tovia Singer was speaking out against being cremated because the bones are supposed to be the material that used for, in part anyhow, to reconstitute us as human beings in the resurrection. So... That view is very Jewish in origin. Yeah, as I you tend well to know. agree with Rabbi mm-hmm. Tovia Singer on that. I'm not a fan of cremation. I'm not going to say it's going to defeat God's ability to resurrect somebody. No. I feel like that's a pretty extreme position to take. Mm-hmm. But I have learned a lot, and I know you've been to Israel, and you've stood on the Mount of Olives, and you see all the the tombs there that are, I don't know why they're buried above ground, but there are all these stone yeah. rectangles, mm-hmm. and... Um, or stone boxes, really, rectangular-shaped boxes, and inside are the bones. And it's like, well, what's the deal with this? Why are they so worried about bones? Or not worried, but uh-huh. uh, concerned yeah. about yes. bones and focused and about caring for the bones. And, yes. you know, they have these ossuaries where, you know, they, they found Caiaphas's ossuary. I know. I saw it when I was in Israel. Incredible. <laughs> or, or in, the Israel yeah, in the Israel uh, Natural History Museum of all places. Yeah. Back in 2004, I was shocked. Isn't it beautiful? Well, it's a beautiful ossuary, but what was most shocking was the, in, was the plaque beside it. Oh, what the did plaque, it say? The plaque beside it said, this was the high priest in the days of Jesus that was responsible for his crucifixion. Yeah. And I, th- I thought to see that advertised in the Israel Natural History Museum was just shocking <laughs> because it's a recognition <laughs> that this thing happened and this is the man oh, yeah. responsible to it i was yeah that was the last thing i saw in the museum on my way out because yeah. we were we had a very short time frame and it was at the entrance of the museum uh, so we saw it as we exited 
Very cool. Fascinating. Very cool. And yeah. when you see that stuff, you just say to yourself, these are real, these are true stories. This yes. is history. You know, you see the uh, the litho, what is that, lithostratos, uh, you know, that, that street that is beneath Jerusalem that was discovered where th- this is where Jesus was beaten or he was, it's the layer that goes back to the first century. It's kind of yes. like underneath yes. the city of mm-hmm. uh, Jerusalem. You see these things, you yeah. say to yourself, like, I, like I've stood there, Tom, like I know for mm-hmm. sure now Vesuvius is a real volcano. I looked into the crater. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, right, it's like, right. Not that I ever right. really doubted it, but like when you do it and you stand there and you see, and you, you, know, you see the cast and the horror on the faces of the people in Pompeii, you're like, okay, this is not a story. Yeah. This is no. history. And uh, right. it's very powerful. But back to your point about resurrection and bones, what really started me on this, this is going to be a really random source, is a Freakonomics okay. podcast episode. They're talking about cremating animals. The guy was saying, when it comes to cremating animals, they, it was, they were trying to do an investigation. The big question they had was, do they actually give you the ashes for your animal? This was like a pet crematorium. Or oh. are they just like scooping random ashes and, yeah. you know, what, what's really going on here? Right. And they were talking, so they got into the subject of cremation and bones. And they're like, well, you know, what really happens in a crematorium is they burn, you know, the human or the animal or whatever. And then the bones are there. Right. Their bones are not burnable. They ju- right. They're just there. So what right. they do is right. they grind them. That's what Tovia said, too. And after they mm-hmm. grind them down, that's the ashes that you get. They're oh. actually ground bones. Oh, is that right? That they okay. return to you. At least that's what this podcast episode was saying. And it was talking about animals, but like it also talked about humans, whatever. Ah. And, it, and it made me think to myself, like, wait a second. I always just assumed the bones desiccated. I assumed oh, you did. that they disintegrated okay. over time. And huh? then it, it, it kind of informed my thinking about, you know, the James ossuary and the Caiaphas ossuary and some of these other ossuary findings, like some of the more sensationalized ones that said, we think we found Jesus and all this, which yes. has been uh, pretty much not accepted by scholarship. But anyhow, the idea of bones lasting for centuries and centuries was just like common sense to ancient people because they didn't have this separation like we have from our dead. Like uh-huh. we don't we don't know, but like they would go a year later uh-huh. back to the tomb and they would pick up the bones and put them in a little bone box. Space yes. is, is, is limited and you want to fit as many ans- ancestors, descendants, relatives in the same cave or tomb as possible. But you're not looking to like mix all the bones together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the, it just kind of made sense to get a box the width of a skull and the length of a femur, and oh, <laughs> to okay. use that to you know organize people and just scr- scratch on the wow. side the person's name. Yeah. And so I think this all goes back to whether we're talking about the Mount of Olives to this day in Jerusalem, or we're talking about the ossuaries from the first century. This or or Tovia Singer's preferences. This all goes back to the same thing, which is this. Really strong belief in resurrection. And so yes. burying your dead in a way that preserves the bones or cares for the bones is, is in a sense, I think, a, uh, an act of faith that the Jewish people have always had. Again, I'm not saying that cremation is a sin or that it's going to damn somebody to, you know, eternal judgment or, you know, that's not where yes. I'm going here. No. But I think... We should ask the question, is this really, does this really fit as Christians? Like, I know it's less expensive, okay? But like, yeah. is it, is that always the right course of action just because something's less expensive? So I, I think burial, traditional burial, it can be an act of faith because uh, you're saying, I'm in a marked tomb. I'm going to rise out of this tomb. Mm-hmm. So let's get back to your, your trip details. I'm trying to picture this, the framework of... Well, picture the setting that the Acts of the Apostles was written in. Is Athens set on a hill? Well, the Acropolis certainly is. The Acropolis is, okay. Yeah. So yeah, there, there are definitely hills there. The Acropolis is a very high point in the center of Athens, and it is kind of steep, uh, I don't know what you call it, like a plateau that just rises out of nowhere. Oh. In the old days, that would be the spot where you would retreat to if Athens were invaded. Because it can be okay. uh, held 
much longer. The Apostle Paul preached in that place? Well, I think he preached at Mars Hill, which is right next to it. Mars Hill. Uh, so, it's, yeah, it's right, right nearby. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul in that setting? Yeah, well, I mean... Can you picture the, him there? <laughs> the interesting thing about the Apostle Paul at the Areopagus or Mars Hill Areopagus. is that he okay. is looking at all these statues. And when I was at, in Athens, uh, I got to go to the museum, the Acropolis Museum, which is a short walk. We got there and we went inside and you, you see all these statues. And these are all these statues that they found. Of course, the Acropolis had actual temples to gods on it. And that wouldn't have been unusual. There would be temples and statues of gods all throughout the city. And that's not weird okay. for Athens either. All Greco-Roman <laughs> cities had statues to gods, shrines, little other ways of worshiping their gods. <laughs> you know, depending on what gods we're talking about, they're all a little different. You know, there's Paul. He's not really from the West. You know, and for, and for his perspective, as, as somebody from Tarsus and Cilicia, Athens is, is the West. <laughs> Okay. From our, you know, we would say okay. Athens is east from us, but uh, yeah, for him, yeah, that's yeah. the west. And, uh, you know, so for Paul, he would have seen plenty of this throughout his travels and stuff. But for whatever reason, his heart was just so troubled in Athens. He saw the people huh. just in the city just given to this in Acts 17. He finds this altar to the unknown God, and he's like, all right, well, here's <laughs> here's some place where I can hook on a gospel presentation. And yes really get speaking. But it's interesting, too, going back to our former conversation about burial and resurrection. When it comes to the part where Paul says that God has furnished proof by yes. raising that Jesus is the Messiah, by raising mm -hmm. him from the dead, the Athenians had no trouble hearing that Jesus would be the Messiah. I don't think that was like a really understood category to them. They oh. wouldn't have a hang-up about that as him being a king or whatever. But when he says he has given proof by raising him from the dead, suddenly they're just like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> Everybody knows you don't want your body back again. This is stupid. Oh, yeah. I'm out yeah. of here. And like the Greeks, right. the Greeks, their standard approach to the afterlife okay. was uh -huh. to get rid of the body. It was not to keep the body or to get the body back restored and renewed. And so this, yeah. this was always a big issue between Jews and Christians, agree on this, over against the, the Greco-Roman, whether the philosophers or just like the folk religion of like going down uh -huh. to Hades and, you know, all the stuff they, you know, they had stories about all that. Have you been to Caesarea Philippi in Israel? Yeah. Isn't that, uh, don't they call that Banya or something? Ba Banyas. Yes. Banyas. And actually, I don't know if you know why it's called Banyas. Well, the, there was a, a shrine to the god Pan there, right? Pan, right. So yeah. the original name was Panyas, but the Arabs have a hard time pronouncing the <laughs> p sound. So they changed it to Banyas, believe it or not. But yes. Well, that makes Panyas. sense. Thank you. Yes. Uh huh. So now you learned something from me for a there change, it is. right? There it is. Yeah, I have been <laughs> okay. there. It's a beautiful uh -huh. spot. And, you know, again, talking about the heat and the, the arid climate of Israel, to have a place yes. with a beautiful water supply. Oh, my. Like Caesarea Philippi, where you say, okay, this is, is, is going to be a big spot. This is going to be a place where people are going yes. to want to go and yes. build things and live because there's plenty of uh -huh. water. Yeah, it's beautiful there, isn't it? It's maybe the most beautiful place in Israel, in my, my view, as far as the physicality of it. Yeah, I, don't know. I loved En Gedi. I thought it was... En Gedi was beautiful, too, yeah. yes. Also water. The, uh, the shrine... So do you remember what the Shrine of Pan looked like? And, uh, and were the details about what was happening there? No, no. Remind me. Okay, there's a, a graven image of Pan on the, the wall of the, the side of Mount Hermon, the base of Mount Hermon there. And there is a cave right next to it. And there would, would have been an altar, if I remember correct, there would have been an altar in front of the cave. And they were doing sacrifices to the god Pan. And they were throwing the sacrifice beast into the cave. And the Jordan River begins flowing from that area. So 
there was some kind of a relationship to throwing the sacrifice into the cave and, and whether or not the blood came out at the Jordan River. That cave on the side of the mountain, Mount Hermon, was supposed to be the gateway to the underworld. Ah, it is certainly the case that the Greeks and the Jews looked very differently at the dead. The Jewish mindset was that the dead are resting, and they had the term Sha'ol for that, the sort of realm of the dead, where all the dead are, they're, they're uh, awaiting, they're asleep. They use that language a lot. Yes. Uh, even in the, the Christian New Testament, tons of references. A lot of our translations just like get rid of it, and they say died or something like that. But the, yes. it actually says fall asleep or fell asleep, ah. which, uh, you know, the, a Greek person wouldn't say that. They would say, no, they're in a different realm, and they're in the underworld of... Hades. And Hades yeah. is not just a realm, it's also the name of a god who's in charge of all of those shades or departed souls. And, you know, so like these are very different views, you know what I mean? Uh huh. And uh, sad to say, but Christianity has more often than not agreed with the pagans over against the early Christian view. Uh, which Unfortunate. Is, which, is, which is a shame, right? Yes, it is. In the, the first conversation I had with Tovia Singer, we hit upon so many touch points that we agree upon. Resurrection, life in the age to come. The term Messiah is something that we can talk freely about. There's so many things from my Christian view that actually are terms that you can talk to Jewish people in this present day about, especially those who are inclined to study the Old Testament. And that's a conversation that most nominal Orthodox kind of Christians cannot have with Jewish people. The, the rule seems to be that Jews have to leave Judaism in order to come over to Christianity. But strangely enough, we received Christianity from the Jews. And so the context that you're, you're seeing here is something that is, is very interesting in restoring Christianity to its first century foundations, which is your your big desire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what that's so, what I'm all about is trying to clear away the accretions of the Middle Ages and the post-Christian developments and getting back to that original earlier version of apostolic Christianity. You know, what what would the church have thought about this in the first century rather mm -hmm. than in the second and following centuries, the, the subsequent centuries? And, uh, you know, I'm not against technology or innovation, but I am against changing our beliefs from what the New Testament says. And that has happened a lot. And it happens very slowly. And I've had a, a, a desire to understand that development mm -hmm. for a long time and did my master's on the subject and was really surprised to see that you know people are just not asking this question. Like, I'm, I'm a, a member of, uh, even to this day, of the, the Boston Area Patristic Society, okay? And so I get emails and, you know, invitations to attend their meetings, which I attended when I lived out there. And, you know, they're held either at Harvard or at Brown University, they, or sometimes at Providence College as well as three schools have good uh, patristics, good early church history programs. Oh. And, uh, you know, so they, they issue these uh, papers a couple times a year. I don't know, like three or four to five times a year. And, uh, you know, you have lint chocolates and a little wine, a little cheese. And, <laughs> you know, you sit around and, you know, just kind of listen in with these, uh, you know, somebody presents on some aspect, some facet of uh -huh. early church history. I've been a member of this for, pff, I don't know, a decade. They have never done a doctrine. Not once. Ah. Not once. There's no interest at all in doctrinal development or this mindset that says, hey, let's get back to living out our faith the way they lived out theirs as far as how we treat people or how we think about the government or whatever practical area. There's zero interest in that in the, the, the more liberal side of the fence. And then on the conservative side of the fence, you have the Catholics that really dominate. And not that there aren't liberal Catholics, I'm sure there's plenty of them too, but I'm talking about the more conservative-minded ones. And they're always just trying to show that what the church teaches now is really what Christians have always believed. So it's apologetic. Huh. It's not, oh, wow. okay, let's see what happened. It's more like, all right, well, 
this person, like for example, Ignatius of Antioch, there's going to be an amazing presentation on this at the Unitarian Christian Alliance Conference next month. Uh, Nathan Massey's done some cutting-edge research on Ignatius of Antioch. Uh, but anyhow, people, Catholic scholars in particular, love Ignatius, and they'll, they'll go to Ignatius and they'll say, "Well, see, Ignatius calls Jesus God; therefore, the Trinity is true." As we, you know, twenty centuries later, teach it, it it's, it's all true because Ignatius said Jesus is God. And uh, there's just so, more huh. problems with that than you can shake a stick at, which you know I won't huh. get into unless you're interested. But like my my point is, th- there's very few scholars who are honestly going to the sources of ancient Christians, whatever books have survived, right? And saying, yeah. what were they saying? And, and just taking them on their own words, their own terms, giving them the credit that they knew what they were talking about, even if it disagrees uh-huh. with what the church later <laughs> said was uh-huh. the right way to think, right? Yeah. So let me let me just give you one example. So for example, Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr doesn't fit with anybody, Right, I mean, he's just idiosyncratic. He has his own way of thinking and talking about things. He will even call Jesus a second god sometimes, and you know, he doesn't think at all that Jesus, even in his pre-incarnate state, was equal with God the Father ever. You know, at the same time, he's he's sort of like very much like enmeshed with the Jews and, and like very much huh. talking to the Jews, and at the same time, yeah. incredibly rude. And it, you know, by <laughs> what I would say, it's totally inappropriate. You know, in some of the wow. ways he. He talks to, uh, in one of his books, the book against Trifo. Oh, Trifo. So, yeah. yeah. So anyhow, hmm. Justin Martyr, you know, a church historian will come along and say, Justin Martyr was just, you know, he was reaching in the dark for the doctrine of the Trinity. He just didn't quite have the language yet <laughs> to express it. And it's like, no, he wasn't. He had a, he had a mature, developed view of who he thought Jesus was. And it's just different than yours, man. Just just allow him to be him. <laughs> you want to squeeze everybody into the same mold, huh? <laughs> he's not hinting at anything. He thinks he knows what he's talking about. You're not <laughs> right, right. He wore the philosopher's robe, didn't he? <laughs> he did, and he had a he had a, a, a little meeting spot in Rome above uh yeah. you know, above a shop. You know, he had a little apartment or whatever and he'd he'd meet with people and he'd teach them what he thought was the definitive understanding of the Christian religion. Just because nobody else later on agrees with them doesn't mean he was just like undeveloped or something you know he he, right. he believed what he believed and it's just different and that's okay and what i see when i look at justin or irenaeus or you know a lot of these guys is i see development and when i see development i think to myself let's roll back the tape and uh-huh. see the trajectory over time. Yeah. What is the vector? Where is this heading? So if I see, huh. you know, a couple of points on a line that go in one direction, I can say, okay, I make a measurement here, make a measurement here, connect those dots and trace it backwards. What's there in the first century? <laughs> and that's wow. that's what I love to do. That's what I want to know. That's my my research, my investigation. Ah. Uh, to find out what's the earliest beliefs and practices. And then I'm crazy enough to think we can live that out today. Yeah, you are a strange bird. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree with you. I guess I am too. <laughs> so, well, and yeah. the thing is, we both came to this from very different milieus, different yes. backgrounds, denominations, and so forth. But we both recognize that it makes logical sense that if the church has gotten off track, then you know the best way to do it is to reform back to right. the you know whatever we can recover of the original version of Christianity, and that's, you know, that's so true. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense to me. A lot of people don't they don't believe in restorationism. They they say, oh, that's you can't go back there. It's impossible. And it's like, well, well why? <laughs> well, let me share you with with you my thought on this. So the the first century church was waiting for the return of Jesus, and it didn't happen in their age, but we who claim to desire the return of Jesus need to be postured as they were. Like, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, like, if Christianity gets far enough away from their origins, it's an awful lot to ask Jesus to return when we've strayed so far from what our forefathers believed. So the, the church that I was uh, put out from is called the Apostolic Christian Church Nazarene. 
And the term Nazarene is a, a term that is very, very honorable, I would say. But when we think in terms of the early church, the term Nazarene meant Jewish believers in Messiah. And I still call myself a Nazarene, even though my community has, uh, for the by and large, has disfellowshipped me. I like to, to trace my origins back to the, the Nazarenes, my, my Jewish brethren, believers in Jesus. And this is something that you touched upon in your, your church history. You think you could fill us in a little bit about the views of different Jewish Christians, Abionites, Nazarenes, and any others that would kind of fit that category? Maybe yeah. give us a little summary. Yeah, to do work on the Ebionites or the Nazarenes is to read late reports by their enemies. Mm -hmm. I don't know of a single document that survives other than I would argue the Didache. I would say the Didache is a Nazarene document. Oh, wow. It reads that way to me. Hmm. Uh, it has a low Christology. It's very Jewish. You know, it's very Christian. You know, and it, it just seems to kind of fit that that mindset. Uh, so I, I, I would argue that the Didache would be a Nazarene uh, document. Now, these these terms, Nazarene, it's actually in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Yep. The sect of the Nazarenes. Right. Why was that? Paul, uh, they Paul said was that about a, uh, Paul, right? Yes, they did. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. So that's old school. Right. But what we can kind of gather is from these late reports. And when I say late, I'm talking like from the year 375. We get mm. this uh, heresy hunter named Epiphanius of Salamis. And he writes a book called the Panarion. And, you know, so this is this is writing 300 years after all the action and the excitement has already happened. Right. Yeah. Where, where's yeah. where's the action? Where's the parting of the ways, as James Dunn's famous book called it? Uh, well, it's really in that post-70 A.D. pre-Justin. So like between like 70 A.D. when the temple got destroyed and the Romans conquered Jerusalem to the time of Justin Martyr where like he begins in, in you know, maybe like uh, 135 was the second revolution, right? right. So you have the, right. the Bar Kokhba revolt. Actually, some people might call it the Third Revolution because there was another one in between the two, but whatever. It wasn't in Jerusalem. Oh, there was. Okay. <laughs> but, oh, uh, wow. um, you know, in that period there, what is that, like, probably like 60, 70 years, something uh -huh. happened. And there was a, a splitting away, and Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians stopped influencing each other. Oh. And it's a really murky period of time. Scholars have all kinds of theories from there was never a parting of the ways. What are you talking about? Uh -huh, <laughs> to well. um, it, it happened because of this or because of that. But let's just put it this way. The, the, the official Christian line on it has always been since the time of Eusebius that the followers of Jesus, when they saw the Roman legions coming, mm -hmm. abandoned the city of Jerusalem. And if that's true... And they, he says they went to Pella. They went to this other area. If that's true, then the native Jewish people who stayed and fought and died, and then many of them also survived, would not very much like the Jewish Christians. No. Because they didn't stay. They so you're talking, from 70, you're talking about from 70 AD that yeah. the Christians would yeah. have left. So like mm -hmm. after the city is conquered by the Romans, things kind of settle down politically. I mean, I guess the last holdouts are at Masada up until what, right. like 73, 74. But like other than that, the, okay, this period ends. The Romans have reasserted their dominance. But, you know, a lot of Jewish people survive. And, and, mm -hmm. and they're not looking at the Jewish Christians positively. They're looking at them negatively. And we have this Berkat Hamanim. Yes. Are you familiar with that? I am. It says, uh, For the apostates, let there be no hope, and uproot the kingdom of arrogance speedily, and in our days may the Nazarenes and the sectarians perish, as in a moment, let them be blotted out of the book of life, and, and so forth. So it's like, okay. Yes. By the time of Justin, he make, makes mention of this, oh. and, and he says, you know, why... Why are you guys cursing us in your synagogues? Right? So, like, Justin knows about it. So, it's got to be before 160. And it's probably after so the So, let Jerusalem. me ask you this. Would that curse 
be specific to Jewish believers in Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua, yes. or would it that was specifically for them because well, they, they were sought, they, they would be the ones to, be to go to the synagogue. So this is something that would be spoken publicly okay. in the synagogue ah. along with the other blessings. And so that would discourage them from attending synagogue then. <clears throat> it would expose them as Primarily. well because they wouldn't be able to recite that. Oh, they wouldn't be able to recite it. You can't curse yourself. Okay. You know, that's just awkward. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yes. Right. So, so, so during the time of the Bar Kokhba revolt, the Jewish believers in Ye- Yeshua, Jesus, would not have taken up arms against the Romans, and this would have been a further offense against the uh, against the revolu- revolutionaries. Well, you know, we, the Jews. we see we see rumblings even before in the. I don't know if it's the Jewish War, or the antiquity of the, of the Jews with uh, Josephus. He talks about how there was a power vacuum just for a moment in Jerusalem, and during that power vacuum, when the old governor had I don't know if he died or just had left or whatever happened to him, but the mm-hmm. new governor uh, I think it was Albinus was on his way. Then the non-Christian Jewish people were able to gang up on James, and, and when James was fairly old, oh. the brother of Jesus, okay. and uh, that they were able to more or less lynch him. You know, they just oh. got a mob together, and uh, they, they were able to, to kill him. So there was already animosity before the war. Okay. The war starts in 66. You know, it, it did blow up from time to time. We see it in the book of Acts, right? There's a lot of animosity between the Jewish... Christians, yes. uh, the non-Christian Jews, okay? Right. Uh, so this, this continues. But after the war, it, it's, it's, it seems like there's not even much real space left for Jewish Christians to even go to a synagogue with this curse that's put mm-hmm. there specifically against them. Again, the war is such a massive historical event, the Jewish War with Rome, 66 to 74, where... I mean, how many kinds of Judaism do we know about from the first century? You have your Sadducees, you have your Essenes, you have the rebellious types, they call the fourth philosophy in Josephus, and you have your Pharisees, and then you so have the Christian the Zealot- Jews. Would there be the Zealots or the Sicarii? Yeah, yeah, that would be the fourth philosophy, the Zealots, okay. the Sicarii, all the revolutionary okay. types, right? So you have like five mm-hmm. types of Judaism, and so mm-hmm. the Christian Jews survive, and the Pharisaic Jews survive, but the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the revolutionaries, they're all gone oh. or completely disempowered okay. after the war. So now you have Pharisaic Judaism, which eventually kind of develops into Rabbinic Judaism. Mm-hmm. And you have the Jesus Jews, and they gave birth to the Christian movement, which is kind of like... It's almost like, in a sense, gone public, like a like a corporation offers an IPO, and then like the huh. the company has kind of a life of its own, independent oh. of what the founder really yeah. <laughs> his vision was. Okay, and maybe that's a good analogy for it, because like Christianity yeah. goes pretty much Gentile, and there it's Jew and Gentile together in the first century for sure. But like as we get into the second century, the kinds of literature that survive from Christian pens. It's just like either ignorant of Jewish practices and interpretations of the Old Testament or outright antagonistic, where you get like (laughs) um, documents from like the middle of the second century. Like I'm thinking of the Epistle of Barnabas and some of the other documents in the Apostolic Fathers where like they're just like, you Jews are crazy because you kept the law. And it's like, how could you ever say that if you're... If you're a little more aware of what the, you know, that that was the law that God gave to the Jewish people to keep, why would they be crazy to keep it? Right. 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 So it seems like there's just a parting of the ways, and that's the term James Dunn used for it. And, you know, we just wish so much that we had, we had more information about it. We just kind of get these little bits and pieces. We don't know yes. exactly how it happened. We just know that From it happened. From hostile witnesses of all that places. So now you've got these Jewish Christians, Tom. Mm-hmm. And they're kind of isolated in the East. They're not well loved by the Gentile Christians. Or they don't have access. Or I don't know. For whatever yeah, yeah. reason, there's just not a lot of yes. interaction. Which is tragic, in my opinion. Absolutely. But they're also alienated from their own Jewish brothers and sisters. Because mm-hmm. they're not allowed in the synagogue. And, you know, if you're in a little village and there's only one place putting shoes on horses or doing some other craft or trade, 
and they don't want to sell to you, guess what? You're in trouble. Yes. You know, because you're one of the Nazarenes or one of the sure. Ebionites. Sure. So, you know, these people had a really tough go of it. And, you know, we hear about them later on. And they may have survived pretty well outside the Roman Empire in the east in the Persian Empire. But we don't know much about that either. So it's really hard to do scholarship on them. There are more questions than answers. But my best guess, okay, and that's really what it is, is a guess, is that the community of James, the brother of Jesus, they didn't really get on board with what Paul and Gentile Christianity was doing. They got on board to a certain degree. And, and this, we okay. see this uh, conflict in the book of Acts 15 and then yep. later on in 15. 22. Wow. What happens is they say, all right, well, you, you can have Gentiles and they don't need to keep the law. It's fine. But we Jews are going to keep the law still. Mm-hmm. I don't think Paul got on board with that. Paul would say Jews don't need to keep the law either. Obviously, they can. Anybody can keep the law who wants to. But Jewish sure. Christians, I should say, I should be clear. I'm not talking about just Jews in general. I'm saying Jews yes. who believe in Jesus yes. because of a covenantal understanding expressed later in the book of Hebrews, whoever wrote Hebrews, that it is clear that Jewish Christians don't need to keep the law. James and his group of Jewish Christians disagree with that viewpoint. They say, no, this is the covenant. We're Jewish Christians. We're going to continue to keep the law. So I think this James community is what left during the war and survived north and east of Jerusalem. And that then this community had a, a doctrinal division where some of them accepted the Gospel of Matthew, which possibly was in Hebrew or Aramaic, you know, some language that the people could readily read. Okay. There are lots of hints of that in the patristic literature. People talk about it quite a bit. They don't talk about any other writing from the New Testament. All, all, all the other books of the New Testament, they never mention as being in Hebrew. Just oh, Matthew. Wow. It's the only one. Just Matthew. Huh. So, yeah. So... Why would you put it in Hebrew? Whether it was written in Hebrew originally or translated into Hebrew, why would why because you have Jewish people reading it. You read the Gospel of Matthew, what does it begin with? A genealogy. Who loves genealogies? The <laughs> Greeks? No, they don't care about genealogies. The Jews love genealogies. So Matthew begins by making a convincing argument that this Jesus of Nazareth has a claim and could possibly be the Messiah because of his ancestry. That's how it starts. Okay. So you've got this community, and in the Gospel of Matthew, as well as Luke, you have the virgin birth. You have the virgin mm-hmm. conception and you know this idea that in, in some way Jesus is the Son of God. Some of the Jewish Christians in this community don't believe that, and others do. And that is, and again, this is a reconstruction based on hostile sources like Epiphanius Mm -hmm. and Eusebius. And there are plenty of later ones, too, like Jerome mentions this stuff. And and, and it's even possible that these Jewish Christians survived and there was some interaction with them. It wasn't just all hearsay, okay? But it's possible for us to know today how reliable these reports are. But so you have the James Jewish Christians. They go away from Jerusalem and they settle in north and east of, of Jerusalem, and they have this difference among them. The ones who believe in the virgin birth are Nazarenes. Mm-hmm. The ones that do not are Ebionites. Both of them believe that Jesus is a human being right. whom God anointed as a yes. Messiah. They both believe mm-hmm. in crucifixion. Both believe in resurrection. Both yes. believe in ascension. Both believe in the coming kingdom. Yes. So the question is, you know, whether he is biologically, whatever that means, you know, like if if there was this miracle to get him started or if he was the son of Joseph. Okay, so that's that seems to be the disagreement there between the Nazarenes and the Ebionites. And here's here's just one more thing to complicate it, make it worse, is some Christians will call both groups Ebionites. Yeah, that's a mistake. They'll say, well, some Ebionites (laughs) believe this and some Ebionites Mm -hmm. believe that. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> it's like wow. right. Well, it seems to me the very, very important doctrines they agreed upon. Yeah. And I, I know I noticed in the Apostle Paul's writing, he never mentions a virgin birth. He does emphasize the authority that Jesus received through the resurrection, most notably in Romans chapter one. That's yeah, where I, mean, I think the closest Paul comes is Galatians four four, 
where it says, uh, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, mm-hmm. born under the law. Uh, mm-hmm. it's sort, sort of like the closest to it. Uh, you can interpret that a number of different ways. So it's fascinating to understand that we've actually lost connection to a large extent to the original source of our, our gospel message. And I suppose that makes, that makes your challenge of restoring first century Christianity even a bigger task. You're yeah. trying to recreate these things based on what you know and based on hostile witness accounts. Here's the good news. We still have the Bible. We have the New Testament. Yes. You know, we can read it. We can see. And it's not like the New Testament is hiding or covering over any controversy. Like the, the Paul James things is, is, is plain as day in Galatians. Like Paul, yes. Paul lays yeah. it out, you know, and, I, and, I, and I'm going with Paul on this. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree with James. I think he was a great man, but I think he just didn't have the full understanding of how Jesus, through his actions, how he affected our relationship with God and, and this whole understanding of covenant. So I'm going to go with Paul on that. What happened among Pauline Christianity is a development that slowly moved away from the New Testament read from a Jewish perspective because I mm-hmm. think Pauline Christianity basically got swamped by Gentiles. Yeah, I think so too. And I think the leaders of Pauline Christianity, uh, probably not in his day, but maybe within a generation or two, became highly educated, intellectual Gentiles who were financially well off enough to get an education because education costed money. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you got to farm or you got to do a craft or a trade, right? So yes. uh, as that as that sort of movement occurred away from apostles and their appointed successors, more towards these intellectuals, we get Christian doctrine shifting away from what's in the New Testament um, into these more Greek and Roman ways of thinking. And uh, Mm -hmm. that's kind of an area where I've been doing a lot of work recently, trying to understand, especially on Christology, how would a a Greek or a Roman person, how would they hear the story of Jesus? What would that sound like to them? And so I've done a lot of work on that, and I'm going to be presenting that in a month as well um, at the Uh, UCA At the conference. conference. Yeah. Okay. But that will be out later on YouTube as well if you don't make it to the conference, you know. I bought my ticket already. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so I'll look forward to that. I guess we probably shouldn't talk too much about it uh, in advance because we, have to, we don't want to take the, the thunder out of your presentation. Well, I, I, I'll, just mention, <laughs> I'll just mention one thing. Okay, so okay. let's imagine you're a, a, a non-believer, you're a pagan, you've worshipped the gods all your life. You've heard stories about Apollo getting banished down to earth and having to work as a servant. You've heard stories about Zeus coming down impregnated women you've heard stories about uh, hercules dad huh hercules dad you've heard stories about hercules as well uh-huh. and asclepius was originally a human who got deified and he got deified to such a level that he became essentially an olympian god that huh. that level of elevation and exaltation was possible so you hear, hear all these stories about these gods who come down to become men uh-huh. Or appear as men, being being uh, made in appearance as a man, right? <laughs> like yes. this is this is their yes, vocabulary. Yes. That's their world. Right. And then you hear lots of stories about humans who had a beginning, normal humans, but mm-hmm. were so exceptional that they got to skip Hades and instead yeah. go to Olympia or instead okay. go to some heavenly realm. Like you, yeah. this is just your world. These are all okay. your stories. Uh-huh. Now you're going to hear a story about. A miracle worker, a Jewish miracle worker, who was executed, came back to life, and now lives in heaven, and is immortalized. You have a category for that kind of a being. Okay. It's called a god. Yeah. Like yes. in our in our language today, yeah. we would say a lowercase g god. Yes. Right. They didn't mm-hmm. fuss with capital and lowercase. You know, like everything's capital pretty much in all the inscriptions we have mm-hmm. in the manuscripts from this period, right? So they were just saying, oh, that, yeah, we, I know, I know uh, plenty of other beings that are like that too. Yeah, they're, they're called gods. 
Okay. And uh, so you're so you're Jesus. trying to say that Jesus is a man and now he's become a god. So like you could just imagine evangel like an evangelism encounter going like that. Yes. And if you don't have that Jewish sensibility to say, well, hold on a second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's yes. only one God, and that's uh-huh. the supreme God who created everything. You can just see like Christians saying, well, yeah, I guess so. Like in that way of thinking, yeah, he's a God. So now people start calling Jesus God. And now the question becomes, well, in what sense is he God? Does he have a beginning before he was a human? You know, and you're just operating in a totally foreign worldview, mindscape, than the Jewish mode, which is the Jewish mode sees Jesus doing miracles and they say how great it is. That God has given such authority to men. Mm-hmm. What do they say right. when they see a miracle in the Book of Acts? When Paul and Barnabas, yeah. you know, get right. that guy. The gods the, are come down to us. The, the of gods course, are that's come what they said. That's what they right. believe could happen, right. right? We really have two different thought worlds that are combining yeah, yeah. In, in weird and innovative ways. Mm-hmm. And that's just like one sure. step along the path that leads to the doctrine of the Trinity, which doesn't oh, really yeah. get fully developed until the late 4th century. So Paul is trying to emphasize that Jesus is a human being, a second Adam. So that has a different flavor to it. Like you have to, Paul is using the first Adam story to introduce the second Adam. And this is a glorified human being who is residing in heaven until God sends him back. That's a different category, isn't it, for the Greco-Roman mind? Yeah, they don't, they don't, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense to them. You know, it's Mm -hmm. just, that's just weird. That's like resurrection. Like, why do you want your body back? And what did Christianity do with that one? We got rid of it. Mm -hmm. You go to any funeral, like, unless it's somebody from my own group of churches, network of churches, or maybe like one or, one or two other denominations, right? Like you go to a funeral, what, 99% of the funerals you go to, they say this person is now in heaven and their soul, whatever. You know, they make up all this stuff. It, you know, it sounds just like the Greco-Roman stuff from the ancient times. It doesn't sound like the Bible. Right. Not to me. Yes. Can you imagine sitting in the audience when Paul was preaching from the Acropolis? Can you put yourself in the, in the shoes of a, a Greek sitting in the audience hearing this message for the first time? And you know the setting. What would have impressed you? or what, You already mentioned this earlier, but like if you as an individual were doing this, what would be going through your mind given your background and context? Well, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding going on. And, and that's just normal. We shouldn't be upset about that. We should expect that. I think we see the same thing today in the 21st century where you try to explain something and somebody just doesn't get it who's not a Christian. And I think that's what was happening here. And what happened is Paul is is evangelizing people. He's talking to people in the marketplace. His Jewish sensibilities, I think, are offended by seeing a city full of idols. It's just as somebody who was raised with the Ten Commandments, it's offensive. I mean, it's offensive to most Christians. Well, I won't say most, but many Christians today are offended by seeing idols and statues and seeing people actually worshiping them. Paul is very disturbed by this. He's trying to, to help. He's reasoning in the synagogue and also in the marketplace every day. You've got the Epicureans. You've got the Stoics there. And then they say, this is Acts seventeen eighteen. He says, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities. <laughs> because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Okay. And see, the word resurrection there is an ostasia. It's a Greek word. It means resurrection, you know, stand up again. But it seems like, and I, I think some translations might do it this way, that they're thinking that Jesus is one divinity, and they think that Paul's saying that Jesus is a divine being, which is interesting, right, in light of what I said just a minute ago. And then the other thing, they think resurrection is, is another divinity, right? So there's just misunderstandings okay. all over the place. They're like, you know, it seems like he's bringing in some new gods. Let's go hear what these new gods have to say. He's kind of like, you remember uh, back in the old days, kids would br- collect baseball cards? Uh-huh. Or like when my kids were little, 
it was Pokemon cards, and you know, you trade with each other. This one, for, it's like gods to the to the Athenians. You know, they're like, oh, oh you've okay. got that. Tell me about that god. I, let me tell you the story <laughs> about this one. <laughs> yes, you know. Yes. So they're interested, and they put them up there, and they say, okay, t- what is this new teaching? Tell us what this is all about. And so we know there's going to be misunderstanding. We know there's going to be confusion, but that's no reason not to get started. And so he does. He mm-hmm. starts in a very friendly and flattering way. He used their own poets, their own poetry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's building the bridge as much as he can to their thought world. But at the same time, he's so disturbed by the idolatry that like, he, just, he just wants to hit that. You know, like it's just, uh-huh. and it's not, it's not out of a sense of superiority. I don't think. I think it's a, a sense of empathy and compassion. And so he just starts in with like explaining who God is, and he's like, "There's a God above everything mm-hmm. else that made everything else, and mm-hmm. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need you to to offer animals. And He believed in animal sacrifice. I don't know if he still believed in animal sacrifice or not, but he believed in it at least most of his life. And still, he's just like, look, he he doesn't need it." He doesn't need anything. God is radically, uh, what do they say, ase. He's not mm-hmm. contingent or dependent on us for anything. And that's not how they thought about their Greek gods. They thought their Greek gods right. needed to be right, cared right. for. They believe that the Greek gods yeah. created humans to do the work for them so they didn't have to do the work all the time, including feeding uh, them these sacrifices okay. that nourish them. <laughs> You know, it's a very, huh. <laughs> very the gods de- were very dependent. Their, their gods were very dependent. <laughs> they needed a bunch of slaves to do all huh. the hard work of cultivating the lands, raising the animals, planting the vegetables, wow. do all the things so that they could be properly cared for and fed. And if you didn't do that, then they messed with you. They stopped the rain or they brought war or whatever, you know. So that's the kind hmm. of thing he's coming against here. And he says, look, the the God who made the world and everything in it, Lord of heaven and earth, does not need temples. This is a radical Mm -hmm. message. I mean, it's just like you're in a city. Now that I've been there, like I've literally seen the temples (laughs) with my own eyes. They're still there. They're still there, Tom. Remnants. Amazing. Uh, Actually, when I was there, there was scaffolding all around it. You know, they're always restoring these things because of the weather, erosion and whatnot. But uh, huh. you know, massive, massive structures, unquestionable. You don't go to a, a Greek, ancient Greek city and say, God doesn't need temples. Yeah, you know, that, they yeah, really yeah, get yeah. their attention. It's like, wow, what is this guy saying? <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. What would it, like these temples were full of pillars and yes. I mean, the structure would have been probably unprecedented structures yeah uh, i mean yeah i mean we're looking at structures that are so impressive that if you didn't live in a city if you live somewhere out in the country you came uh-huh. to a city it would just take your breath away and then going yeah. into the temple itself seeing most of these temples they have what's called an apse which is kind of like the back uh, curved area where they had the statue itself and oh. to see, you know, this huge statue, the artistry was magnificent. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I've seen this where, I think I saw this in a museum in Ephesus on site. They have a little Ephesus museum there. And they had the head of Domitian, which is a Roman emperor. Oh, really? mm-hmm. And uh, it looked like a baby head. The proportions were all wrong. You know, oh. just, you know how like baby heads look? Weird. I, I don't know really how to describe it. Like there may be a little squat. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Compared to the rest of the body, you mean? Uh, no, no. Or, it was just the head. Or it was just it the was head. Just, just the, the head. head. Okay. And it, and it, it okay. looked like a baby head. And I asked my teacher, I was a part of a class at Boston University. I asked my teacher, I'm like, what's the deal with this? Why does it look like a baby head? And he just kind of laughed a little bit. And he said, get low. Imagine this being 20 feet up in the air. Oh. Change your perspective and look at it again. And it was exactly right. If you huh. got low and looked at that same head of Domitian, from that angle that you would see it from the ground, all the proportions were perfect. So it was designed to be looked up to. Right. So we're wow. looking at people that have the artistry, the skill, 
to, aye, aye. you know, to like factor in perspective and angle. Wow. You know what I mean? Like that's something I would yeah. never think of. You know, of course I'm not a mm-hmm. sculptor, but you know, I mean, yes. the, you come in and you and you're confronted by this stone object that is beautifully mm-hmm. done. It just takes your breath away for anyone right. to question it, it. It would just be like, "What are you talking about, man? Everybody believes in this." And then there's a parade where they bring the portable idols through the city, and then they end up out front of the temple, and you get a big barbecue. And everybody's rejoicing, and oh, yeah. you know the Jews and the Christians are just like, uh, we're not going. We're gonna stay home. <laughs> free meat, right? And they're, they're <laughs> well, free meat not... for the pagans, right? <laughs> yeah, for the pagans, right? Right. Yeah. Do you happen to know this story about the Roman general? Was it Pompey that when he came into Jerusalem, and he was going to go into the holiest of holies, and the priests were standing in the way, and he ordered several several of them killed with a sword. He wanted to see what the God of Israel looked like. Yeah. And, and he entered into the holy, holy, holiest of holies after these priests gave their life, and he found nothing. <laughs> what a surprise, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so that Paul is preaching the same unseen God, but he's preaching the Jewish Messiah who was seen, who was raised from the dead, exalted into heaven, and whom God made judge over the earth. So this is, the Athenians are being told that this Jesus, God gave authority to, for judgment, and that the world will be judged by him. Yeah, uh, even before that, you know, just talking about how you mentioned that Paul quoted a couple of their poets, you know, that in him we move and have our being, we live and move and have our being, and uh, the other statement, for we indeed are his offspring— Yes. You know, there's a lot of, depends on how deep you want to go in this, Tom, but like there's a lot going on with the schools of the philosophers. Cause, you know, delve into it. Sure. Okay. Sure, please. So, so you have the Epicureans founded by Epicurus, and then you have the Stoics founded by Zeno, and uh, they are just like total opposites, right? <laughs> so the, uh, the okay. goal of the Epicurean is to, uh, to seek pleasure, uh, but not in a, a primitive, like, spring break frat party way, you know, where, like, you just go crazy and then you, you're you in pain and suffering the next morning. That's amateur <laughs> okay. hour. for The, Ep- the Epicureans are maximizing <laughs> pleasure over the course of your entire life. Okay. What would maximize my pleasure? And the Epicureans okay. tended to say that either the gods don't exist or they exist, but they don't care about us. So... You don't need to worry about the gods. There's a lot of precursors to uh, modern atheism and agnosticism there. But uh, the Stoics are saying, oh, pleasure is bad, and you've got to serve the gods, you have civil duty. The Stoics tended to be the ones in charge of the cities, and the Stoics are absolutely convinced that pleasure is inherently sinful. Like any kind of, any kind of pursuit of bodily pleasure is, well, I would say at least questionable but probably, like, if you could really live without food that tastes really good or beds that are nice and soft or a woman's touch or a man's touch, if you're a woman, you know, like, that you would be happier. You would live the good life. So the philosophers are all, all about, Greek philosophers in particular, are all about how do you lead the good life. Then you have the cynics, which are not mentioned here, so we don't need to get into the cynics. But the Stoics and the Epicureans, they have their own view about the gods. The Epicureans are convinced that Gods don't care about people. Why? Because the good life is characterized by maximizing pleasure. And what pleasure could a God possibly gain by being at all aware of the miseries in the human world? So therefore, the gods are out to lunch where they don't exist. Whereas the Stoics are like, no, the gods exist, and they are very much like involved But they're punishing in tune with this mindset of pleasure being wrong or questionable. I'll just add one one other thing here. There's a lot about the logos in Stoicism. Well, let me me picture it this way. Imagine you you are a dog tied by a rope on the back of an ox cart. You can pull. You can bark. You can protest and just like freeze up your limbs. But wherever that ox is pulling the ox cart, you're going. <laughs> so the Stoic is saying, 
walk with the ox cart in the direction that the ox is going. That's the logos. So the logos is kind of like pulling or pushing everything wow. along in a certain direction. And you're the dog tied to the back of it. So you want to hmm. go with fate or logos into the predetermined direction that everything is going already. Oh. Right? So there's a lot of philosophical stuff, huh. baggage, ideas going on here that Paul, you know, he would be aware to some degree. But he's bringing this Jewish message about a, a crucified and risen hero yeah. who is now right. appointed to this exalted role from which he's huh. going to come and rule yeah. the world. It's, it's, very, it's, it's very political so, uh, and so non-philosophical. You... He's, like, he's not engaging with any of their philosophical yeah. focuses. He doesn't talk about pleasure. He doesn't talk <laughs> about fate. He's... He's just he's like coming, he's just he's like coming, an alien coming in yeah, here, and they, yeah, and they don't yeah. know what to do with him. They're just like yeah, resurrection, yeah. Yeah, right, right? So so when he projects Jesus, he's talking about a human being that entirely of his own free will offered himself up in order to gain life for himself and for the rest of humanity, and God and for that reason God exalted him and made him judge over all of humanity. This is really strange stuff. To them. It just would have it's sounded so like yeah weird. And it just but then a couple people believe right. Yeah, uh, Damaris Di- and Demetrius, right? Or Di- no, Di- Dionys- Dionysius and Dionysius. Damaris. Yeah. What does Dionys? What does the name mean? Dion- <laughs> Dionysius. <Any> Dionysius. <laughs> so a lot of times, what you do is you put a little I in the end of the last syllable of a name to make it for a human. So Dionysius. Okay is the god Dionysius is a human named after the god Dionysus is the oh. god of partying uh equivalent oh, really? to Bacchus the uh, Roman god so the D- Dionysus oh. is the god of wine and parties and orgies oh. and just you know Oh that's interesting. <laughs> that would be quite a conversion, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, it doesn't mean that this guy was into that <laughs> no, lifestyle. No, that he was necessarily, you know? but yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, you know, that's just what the god was wow. was known for. He's the kind of like yeah. the patron god of uh, feasting mm-hmm. and 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 partying and whatnot. You can imagine he was a very popular god to worship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I imagine, especially for the Epicureans, if they yeah, happen yep, to if yep. they happen to worship a god, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So, could you comment a little bit on the first, say, two hundred years of Christianity, and maybe when was the the martyrdom of Perpetua, and was it fel- felis- felicity? Felicitas? Felicity. Yeah. Felicitas or you, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, what kind of felicity? I think that's the name kind, we get from it. Yeah. They were two different individuals that were that were martyred at the same time. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, they were. What would their faith have been like? How would you frame it with respect to the gospel that Paul was preaching? The martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas or Felicity occurred in Carthage. Okay. So. Carthage is North Africa, and mm-hmm. uh, I know that it was 3rd century. I'm, I'm not sure when exactly. I'm just looking up uh, about it right now. Yeah, like early 3rd century, so like 203. So this is okay. kind of like a really interesting period in time, the 3rd century. We happen to know a lot about Carthaginian Christianity uh, from Tertullian. Oh, Because uh, okay. Tertullian mm-hmm. wrote in the 190s, 170s, 190s, and early 200s, up until yeah, about like there, 213. Right? Yeah, yeah, and he's mm-hmm. from that area. And uh, so Tertullian would be like the main guy to go to if you want to know what, you know, at least upper crust Christians thought about things. And, uh, you know, by his time, there there were some developments that were already occurring. And, you know, I'm, I'm not really 100% sure what he believed about the afterlife, I've seen some reports, like ancient Christian reports, saying, oh, Tertullian believed in the kingdom. Uh, I think that's certainly possible. Uh, But I think he also held a very philosophically mainstream view of the soul, that souls are immortal, go up to heaven. I think he was already uh, in that direction, if not wholly uh, embracing that. And as far as like Jesus and God and stuff like that go... He, ha- he holds to a very physical doctrine of the Trinity. Like, he's actually the first 
first person that coined uh, Latin f- person to uh-huh. use the word Trinitas, which is the word Trinity. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Tertullian's Trinity has sort of like a God substance. And the Father has more of it than the Son. And the Son has more of it than the Spirit. And so uh-huh. I always can imagine it as like a, what do you call it? A fertilized egg. An embryo. Okay? okay. So like an embryo, like a single cell. Mm-hmm. And then it's it divides, and then it divides again, right? So like, okay, uh, except usually with cells they divide equally, right? But in this case, you have this single cell called the father, and it, and a little portion of it divides off, and that becomes the son. And then okay. a little portion of that becomes a spirit. So like, there's less divine stuff, substance in the okay. son than there is in the father. It's a very different way of thinking about. <laughs> okay. Any of this than what we've just been talking about with the Apostle Paul. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think Tertullian is kind of like la- later on, you know, more than 100 years after Christ, uh, mm-hmm. 170 years after Christ. Okay. And so it could be that Perpetua and Felicitas had some ideas about that. But one, one of the most interesting quotes from Tertullian is that he talks about the threeness and he's super concerned that other Christians in his area will find it hard to believe oh. <laughs> that they are preferring oneness to threeness. That, that most Christians prefer oneness to threeness. Yeah, in his local area. So yeah. uh, he, I think, tert- you have to be careful. Like, just because somebody's writing survived doesn't mean they characterize everyone no. in that area. Like, no. Doesn't even matter if you're necessarily a leader. Doesn't mean everyone else bel- believes that too. So when you ask me about Perpetua and Felicitas from the same town, the same part of North Africa, I'm going to think of Tertullian because he wrote around this time. But that doesn't okay. necessarily mean that they 100% were on board with his philosophical speculations. Okay, they could have been one of the people that were just like, you know, I don't know what Brother Tertullian's on about. You know, and he he eventually got pretty radical. Because he, he joined up with the Montanists mm-hmm. and took a very stoic view where he started saying that, you know, you shouldn't even have sex within marriage. Wow. That you should live with your wife as if she's your sister. Huh. You know, and this is, again, going back to our earlier point about the Jewish Christians and the non-Jewish Christians. That if only we had our Jewish brothers still in, in, involved and engaged a lot of the shenanigans with weird sexual views that permeated early Christianity in the second yeah. century onwards, we could have combated. Yes. Instead, we ended up with priests who don't get married, and now they're gonna. The priest is gonna officiate a, a marriage, and the priest has never been married. <laughs> and yeah. then the priest is gonna teach you how to be a parent, and the priest has never yeah. raised children. You read yes. the New Testament, man. It says a bishop has to be the husband of a wife, and he has to have kids. Right? I mean, where yes. did all this come from? Yeah, well, yeah. these were Greco-Roman yeah. ideas in the culture that kind of crept into Christianity. We didn't have that Jewish antidote within the body of Christ to, to fight off Yeah, what these, a pity. What uh, a pity. ascetic sensibilities. We have to pray for a revival among our Jewish brethren in Israel that many would come to Messiah according to the first century Nazarene perspective. Yeah. I've met a few. I interviewed yeah. one, so... May God bring it to pass. Yeah. So anyhow, on Perpetua and Felicitas, just a brief story about them is that they mm-hmm. uh, got arrested. This is probably one of the clearest and most powerful examples of Christians recognizing heroism and courage in women that you can find in, in ancient times where basically these women are the heroes of the story. They're mm-hmm. the ones that very boldly face <laughs> down a just terrible torture. And, you know, they, they, they hold themselves with poise. One of them's a slave, and the other huh. is a, a noble woman. Yeah. And they, they, it's just this beautiful example of Christian women who are going to be respectful to the authority and defiant at the same time. <laughs> I just love it. It's so yeah, powerful. Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. anybody can just be like, I don't care what anybody thinks. You're all, you know, I'm not going to listen. That's right. childish rebellion, right? Or yeah. Anyone can just show respect and, and never have the courage to stand up for their faith and just become a sycophant, right? But these women, they're just like, no, I can't go with you on this, but I'm still going to call you sir. 
<laughs> and then defy <laughs> you wow. by not bowing to Caesar's image yeah. and holding true to Christ. You know, it's incredible, incredible, powerful example to all of us. One thing we can take away from this is that they held that Jesus was Lord, like the only one to whom you should bow and serve among the sons of humanity. Is, is that safe to say? Like Jesus, not Caesar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I think it's, there's so much going on here politically. We have clear statements in the New Testament to show proper honor and respect to the emperor, to uh, those in authority, whether emperor or provincial governors. We have clear statements to pay our taxes. But Caesar is not content to be the ruler of the Roman Empire. He wants to be mm-hmm. Lord. You know, he wants, yes. he, I think he claims, in the Christian's view, he was claiming more than just political power. Mm-hmm. So my suspicion is that that's really where the conflict comes in. Because Christians die for this left and right. Yeah. So it's not, it's not a minor, it's not like a, 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 a difference of how to say things correctly. You know, it's considered to be a major issue. But usually it's, it's the idea of offering incense to the genius of Caesar, which is kind of like this uh, spirit. Oh. I don't know if it's an ancestral spirit or what, but like there's, there's some other stuff going on other than just politics okay. and what they're asking them to do. And they're refusing and they're saying, no, nah, I'm not going to swear by the genius of Caesar. Genius is like a spirit. It's not like being really okay. smart. I'm sorry if that's confusing. No, no. Just briefly, does this go back to the the Caesar cult worship from Asia Minor? Cult worship was already it's already getting big. It's already, they're already starting to recognize, you know, this title son of God. We have this inscription from Preen, a, a city from ancient uh, well, modern day Turkey, but ancient Asia, right? And mm-hmm. uh, in in this inscription they talk about Octavius that he is a son of God, changed his name to Augustus, the first emperor. Uh, mm-hmm. I would say Julius Caesar was not really an emperor, but, uh, you know, certainly the first Caesar. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But uh, Octavian, his, his successor, becomes the first real emperor who actually wields the power without getting, like, stabbed to death for it. And he defeats uh, Mark Antony at the Battle of Actium, and he is hailed as a son of God, and the people in the city of Preen say, you know what, we're going we're gonna to restart our calendar based on oh. your birthday. Is that where it started? Uh, yeah. In that city? And of course, to this day, uh-huh. uh, the month of August yeah. hails back to Augustus and this, uh, this whole thing. But um, they start giving living Caesars authority and honor that is beyond just the uh, political office. Okay. And that really just... For Jews and Christians, it's just like, it's too cringy. It's too much for us to admit to that authority. We'll admit yes. that God has put in authority those who are in authority, but we can't say beyond that, you know, to, yeah, right. to say, okay, yes. well, there's some metaphysical reality occurring here that we need to bow the knee to. It's, it's too much. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And a lot of it had to do with sacrifice, you know, because sacrifices worship and, you know, the Christians never offered any sacrifices to anyone other than God. In the very early days, I think Christians were still offering sacrifices in the temple, even after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, because I don't think the understanding that the book of Hebrews explains was immediately clear. I think it took time for uh. Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians to be like, oh, okay, the sacrifice has been given once for all. So I think that understanding was already starting to be present before the temple got destroyed. But it's a, it's a moot point afterwards because after the year 70, there are no sacrifices to this day Yes, right, for the right. Jewish people or for yeah. Uh, Christians. Yeah, the Jews had to reformat their religion in order to accommodate that reality, right? Right. So that's uh, rabbinic Judaism is the byproduct of that. Yes, rabbinic Judaism is the the successor of the Pharisees, and you know what we see with rabbinic Judaism is a focus, just like the Pharisees, a focus on Torah observance rather than a focus on temple and sacrifices. Not that Pharisees didn't believe in those things, but that was more the purview of the Sadducees in the first century, rather than 
you know, the worship of God through sacrificing of animals, the worship of God through mitzvot, the commandments. Ah, mitzvot. okay. Well, based on what you've learned doing this series on the first 500 years of Christianity, what is your advice, what is your vision looking forward for the restoration of first century Christianity? Yeah, well, I think we've already stated pretty clearly the motive that drives me. It's the same motive that drives you, and it's this impulse that says Christianity has gotten off track, so we want to get back to the earlier form of Christianity, apostolic, it's the Christianity at the time of the apostles, as far as the, the beliefs that we can find in the New Testament and read the New Testament from a first century perspective so that we're not reading it from we're misreading it from a 21st century perspective or American perspective or just a, a technological perspective that they didn't have. So that's really the impulse that's driving me. As a result of that, I have been so curious about how Christianity developed. And I remember I used to ride the train from Providence to Boston every day with this Mormon guy uh, named Hans. Great guy. And he was telling me, oh, it's fascinating. You're studying early church history. I said, yeah, Hans, you know, it's, I'm into it. It's, I'm curious about it. He says, oh, well, we Mormons, we believe that the church completely fell away right after the apostles and didn't get <laughs> reformed or rediscovered until Joseph Smith. Oh, wow. And I was just like, Hans, baby, there's just no way. <laughs> there's just no way you can't i mean there, there's no institutional church yet there's no powerful centralizing authority to force anyone to do anything or to think anything it's all based on persuasion and if you look at the second century it's the wild west you got gnostics you got marcionites you got valentinians you got <laughs> philosopher types like justin You've uh -huh. got more down-to-earth type Christians. You've got the yeah. Jewish Christians. You've got all these things all at the same time, uh -huh. separated by great distances. And yes. people don't travel like we travel today. They don't travel like that in the ancient world. Right. There's no communication other than if you can convince a traveler to carry a letter uh -huh. that costs you big money to have written. Uh -huh. Right? So, I mean, it's yes. just there's just no way to force everyone to fall away from original Christianity very fast. It's got to be a slow process and uneven, where in some areas they're still holding to this view that has already started to develop differently in other areas. Uh -huh. Right? Does that make yes. sense? Yeah, sure so, it does. So I think I was Absolutely. able to show that in, not that that was like what I was trying to prove or anything, it's just uh -huh. an observation, that when you look at all the different strands, and you know what I do is I cover it topically. So I'll just like one lecture on the Gnostics. And when I do the Gnostics, I'm not, I'm, my goal is not to blast the Gnostics and say, what a bunch of idiots. How do they believe in this crazy stuff? No, uh -huh. that's not the goal. You have to take a look at my Gnostic lecture to see what you think, if, I, if you think I succeeded. My goal is to present it on its own terms so you understand what it is. And if anything, I want you to understand the attraction, the pull of Gnosticism. Which, I don't know if I really succeeded at that. You, you did succeed. Okay. You did Gnosticism succeed. Gnosticism yes. was so attractive that for decades, maybe even centuries, Christians wrote books against it. Right? Hmm. Why do we have so many of these heresiologies where it talks about the Gnostics? Because it was a real issue that Christians were facing in their local churches, and they're hearing about in other churches where people are getting taken out into the, the mm -hmm. Gnostic world and saying, you know what, you guys are fine, but you're a little primitive. You're not really up on Plato. No offense. But like what you're saying doesn't really jive with, you know, the cutting edge, you know, education of today. Uh -huh. Whereas yes. the Gnostics was just like, oh, man, sounds so good. So that's what I'm trying to do. Whether I'm talking about the Gnostics or Origen or Philo or Clement of Alexandria or whatever, is I'm trying to put the listener or the, if you watch it, the viewer in tune Put you into that world and do it in uh -huh. a way that's based on the primary sources so that you can hear them in their own words. And, I, and this, is not, this, is, this is common in the, in the academy, okay, in the universities. Yes, this, is, this uh -huh. is standard. University will take it to another level. In their own words, exactly 
not in their own words translated into English because that's oh. amateur hour. You know, you okay. should really have a, a full command of classical Latin and classical Greek if you're going to do uh-huh. business with the with the early church fathers. Yeah. Obviously, that's way too much to expect of a popular audience, you know, uh-huh. to do that. But in most churches, in most just like even books, people are telling the story of Christianity all the time. And what they're not doing is letting the, those early Christians speak for themselves or those early heretics speak for themselves because then you can characterize them however you want. So that was a big motive uh, behind my class was to show people, put people into the, their world. And it was really like an intro where I, I was anticipating that people who take this early Christian history class would, or early church, what do they call it, early church history, that they would then be able to do their own research. And they would be able to get it like a, a lay of the land with my lecture and then be able to say, okay, well, let's follow up on some of these books that I mentioned in the, in the, in the uh-huh. class itself so that they could do their own research. Because, you know, it's hard for me to predict what somebody's really interested in, right? Well, so I tried to cover everything in a survey uh-huh. mode where you could get a little understanding. Yeah. So you talked about vectors, and what you're doing is you're trying to allow us to trace these vectors back to the original source, so to speak. Yeah. Well, I think you can see that in this class, especially, you know, like I mm-hmm. do a lot with Christology. I didn't want to, like, just only focus on that because there's so much other stuff. But, uh-huh. like, Christology really becomes such a big deal in the 4th and 5th centuries in particular And I knew that was coming, so I wanted to, like, hit the precursors along the way. And I think you can really see that development very clearly in the class that I did. But also, there was always a minority. There was always another group of Christians that were like, yeah, I don't think so. You know? (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know, like, even in in the 4th century, you have uh, Photinus Photinus? Uh of Sirmium, right? And he's a bishop. And he's a biblical Unitarian. He, he, never, he doesn't even believe in the preexistence of Jesus. And he's a bishop. He's a recognized bishop in a yeah. major city where a lot of creeds get developed. Or Paul of Samosata before him, right? So like he's, he's such a big deal over there. And then you have other important Christians who live outside the Roman Empire. Here, here I, I just offer a little teaser. I don't know when this episode you're planning to air it, but uh, I interviewed Sam Tiedemann on Afrahat. Have you ever heard oh. of Afrahat? No. All right. So. This would be great. You're going to love this. So Afrahat is living in Persia. He's writing in Syriac. He's approaching everything from a very Eastern point of view. And he says, if you run into some Jews, this is in uh, 17 of his demonstrations. If you run into some Jews that ask you the question, why do you call Jesus God? And why do you worship Jesus? This is what you should say to them. Afrahat says, you should say to them, we call Jesus God because God has seen fit to give the title of divinity to exceptional humans like Moses, who's also called God. Oh, wow. (laughs) We worship Jesus because God has seen fit to to give that honor to humans who are deserving of it. And then he gives other examples of Israelite kings or or other individuals in their own Persian society that you would take the knee before. You don't, you're not believing their God, but you are worshiping that person in this like lower sense of of bowing and and so forth. And it's like, wow, this is an incredible testimony. It's from the year 340, but it's not in the Roman empire. It's in Persia. And we have very little, very little from yeah. Persia from this period because eventually right. the Muslims come yep. and you know you don't have the copying continuing by the monks and the monasteries and, and so forth because it becomes Muslim over. Yeah, yeah. Right? But this, yeah, this, so, this is a witness to a Christology that is either biblical Unitarian with no pre-existence or it's subordinationist Unitarian where you do have pre-existence but it's clear that there's still only one God at the top. Either yeah. way... It's a very Unitarian Christology coming out of Christian, and, and Afrahat's no small guy. You know, he's a, he's uh-huh. a monk, but he's of uh-huh. some, some significance. Very interesting. Yeah. So who knows outside the Roman Empire what the numbers are actually of biblical Unitarians? Yeah, could be staggering. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So. And you know, certainly the Germans that eventually conquered the Roman Empire, 
they were non-Trinitarian, mm-hmm. you know, for a long time. I covered that in yeah, you know, I remember the, the Aryan kingdoms. That. Yeah. Yes. Nobody knows about that one either, Tom. Yeah. Well, you revealed <laughs> it. Thank you. <laughs> just, I'm just curious to know, like, do you have any idea how many hours it took to prepare for this 500 year? Oh, that's, to- that's unanswerable because, <laughs> because, you know, this is, this is my field of study. You know, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the first exposure, I, I think I mentioned this in the first episode, in the introduction of this class. I was at the Atlanta Bible College in Georgia, mm-hmm. and I took a block class, a one week long block class. And a professor came in, I think his name was uh, Jim Graham, if I remember correctly, uh, out of Arizona. And uh, he covered the Justo Gonzalez book on uh, early church history. And I remember him just like talking about all this stuff and me thinking to myself, what are you talking about? What? Who are these people? Like, uh-huh. I've never heard of it. Like, it was just like a whole new field. Hmm. And I'm like, why doesn't anybody else talk about these names and these ideas? And like, what? why is this hidden? But like in evangelical and most Protestant Christianity, we do not do church history. We do mm-hmm. Bible, we do theology, you know, but you, we're not doing, we'll do a lot of apologetics, you know, a lot yeah, of You focus. might learn about John Calvin or Martin Luther or something like that, right? <laughs> Perhaps. Maybe. Okay. So, so, so you had an interest from very early, early t- age. Yeah. So however many hours that class was, and then you had part two of that class. And then after that, I was like, you know, this stuff is super fascinating and I remember at Boston University, I just, you know, really focused on it. And I, I took every class I could at Boston University, wow. Boston College, and Harvard on the subject of early Christian history because it was just like not a major field at any of those universities. So I, I was just like taking a class wow. here and a class there and just like kind of okay. making my own program in a sense. So you went to Harvard University as well? Yes. You attended classes there. Okay. Cause I that's... mean, I went... I, <laughs> I'm not, I didn't apply and get in, but you know, when you're in yeah. uh, Boston University or if you're in any of Boston theology school, you can cross register to other schools. So I was a, a oh. BU student, but I was actually attending classes at these other schools. Interesting. Um, wow. And at Harvard is where I learned most of what I know about Philo, some of what I know about Origen, because we read Philo in Greek. Well, we read Plato in Greek and then Philo in Greek. So we read Plato's Timaeus and then Philo's De Epiphitio Mundi, which means uh, on the creation of the world or on the works of the world. Wow. So we're reading these things in, in such a way that like, you see the influence of one on the other. Okay. So if that makes any sense. So I, I don't know how many hours I've spent on church history, but like, <laughs> there's a lot in the background. But even so, I did a lot of, a lot of fresh research for this class. Oh, that's what I was kind of interested in knowing like like in just in preparation for this class you read several books i mean you must have been engrossed for hours upon hours and taking notes and then trying to synthesize all this down yeah. for your audience yeah and and you know i had to buy a lot of books too you mm-hmm. know i probably spent over a thousand dollars in books just to just to do <laughs> this class because you know i'm trying to get those primary sources yes. and a lot of times the only thing available is like those old 1800s translations that are in the public domain. Mm-hmm. But, you know, scholarship has has done a lot. And, you know, a, a more modern translation is going to be based on better manuscripts or more manuscripts. And so I'm trying to give people, you know, the best, not yes. just a lot of times the 1800s stuff is fine. But like I wanted I wanted the the, the most up to date versions uh, that scholarship was doing. And, you know, I also have full access. To, well, I wouldn't say full access. I have good access to most journal articles from attending Boston University. As an alum, I'm, I, have, I still have access. So I'm able to access journal articles, uh, which sometimes, you know, you find an article that's like from this very year. Sometimes it's an article from 10 years ago, 20 years. But like those articles, a lot of times, would be my window into a subject where oh. then I could look at their footnotes, look at their sources, and oh. be like, okay, this is the version of this huh. that, that we're using these days, wow. as opposed to what was cool ten, or you know happening 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, I'd like to thank the Lord and you for your efforts in bringing this 500-year history and for all your insights. Did you uh, enjoy the class? I did. You know, I, it's probably more enjoyable to listen to an episode a week than trying to cram uh, eight episodes into, or, you know, six episodes into a day. <laughs> but, you know, there's a difference between getting a feel for the stuff and actually being able to retain it. This is something, obviously, you've been thinking about a lot over the last, how long, 20 years, 15, well, 20 and years? And I've taught, ter- I've taught a similar version of this class at uh, the mm-hmm. Atlanta Bible College. I've done a lot with it o- over time. So th- this is like iteration upon iteration, development upon development. Yes. And, um, you know, just kind of like this is the next level of it. You know, I think I probably previous versions were like 15 sessions long. This one was what, 22? 22, 21 or 22. Was it? So uh, yeah. we're, we're talking about a lot more added material. And, you know, the, the area where I've always like, had the as the greatest weakness has been in the east uh and in the south where i just didn't you know just because of the way christian education happens or or uh church history education like the focus is always on europe and so Mm -hmm. i was able to like really expand beyond that getting into the barbarian kingdoms uh which is still european but then also getting into the african kingdom of axum in ethiopia and Mm -hmm. learning a lot about uh, the Armenians. I actually did a, a project last year on Armenian church history. So I've got like a whole library of Armenian church history books. And I've got a lot of familiarity oh. with that now, which is really helpful for yes. uh, for this class. And then Asian Christianity, was I was just blown away by, uh, I got a couple of really good books on that with like really good primary sources where they would quote the originals and, you know, really uh, help me to see what was going on in India yeah, and yeah. I uh, found that you know, particularly fascinating. I was yeah, just like, yeah. wow, this stuff, I, I, you know, because like I always hear, okay, Thomas is in India. You know, you ask any right. Indian person, that's what they say. And you're like, but is there yeah. any actual evidence for that? <laughs> well, you actually demonstrate so. that there were actually ships that were making their way out there and back big yes, ships. That blew with, my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the Roman Empire, you could live 10 miles away from a, another village uh-huh. and never visit. Because of, you know, there, there's not a road that goes between the two. Okay. Or they don't have a commodity that you need. Yeah. Right? And you just never visit, right? Whereas mm-hmm. at this very same period, you could end up going thousands of miles yeah. from yeah. the Red Sea to Sri Lanka or India. And that was <laughs> happening on like a regular basis, that trade route. You know, it's incredible. Yeah, I just, well, I had a, I have a pretty famous ancestor who was the governor of South Carolina. He had a plantation, the Middleton Plantation. I'm not really proud of him. He was a slave owner and so forth. Well, that's a bummer. Uh, Yeah, yeah. His name is Arthur Middleton. He actually signed the Declaration of Independence. His plantation is right along a river that goes out to Charleston. And what would happen, the tide goes out from that place. The tide goes out in the morning and it comes in in the evening. So he would load his ships, his river boats up with their goods. The tide would take the goods with the slaves that were taking it to market in the morning. They would load the same ships up with dainties for the plantation, and the tide would bring them back in the evening. So it was like a perfect setting to conduct that kind of trade, and it was you know, just excellent for business. And you were talking about the, the winds that carry ships out to India at one season and carry them back in the other direction. It was kind of like, it just re- reminded me of that kind of scenario where, where the weather currents were just the perfect uh, match for the kind of trade that was going on. Yeah. 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 So I, let me just encourage your audience for a second. If you want to know the inside scoop of what happened in early Christianity, Check out my class, Early Church History. <laughs> Amen. That's good. And it'll That's at least good. give you an introduction, uh-huh. you know, uh, and then you can use whatever resources that you have available or, or buy some books on it and really delve into your subject so that you understand it better and you can understand what was going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, I, you know, it's, it's, it's investigative and it's exciting to learn. And th- we didn't really get into this, Tom, but like there's also so many inspiring Mm-hmm. individuals 
and, yes. I, and events that occurred that yes. like I, I just carry with me. Right. Um, and so many deplorable, horrifying situations that remind me not to repeat the mistakes of the past. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So there's yeah, an actual the... practical benefit to this. <laughs> yes, Sean. We got some examples on both sides. Very, very distinct examples on both sides. Well, may God bless you. May he provide for you and your ministry and enable you to continue the wonderful work you're doing. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure, and I know for a fact, many, many have appreciated it. Your podcast, Restitutio, was really instrumental for my own faith journey because you're not afraid to tackle so many very difficult subjects that no one else is willing to talk about and things that really need to be reasoned through and compared to the biblical sources, the truth that we have in God's word. So uh, God bless you, Sean. Thank the Lord and you for your time as well. Thanks for having me. Well, that brings this lengthy interview to a close, perhaps a record length episode for today. I hope you enjoyed it. It's somewhat of a meandering conversation, but we got into a lot of topics that I think are relevant for understanding, especially the New Testament and early church history. So if you'd like to leave any feedback, ask any questions, come on over to restitutio.org, find episode 516, Sean Finnegan on Restoring Authentic Christianity, and leave your comments there. Also, once again, for the trip with Dr. Jerry Weirwell, which is a 16-day Footsteps of Paul and John Turkey and Greece trip, you can find a link to the full itinerary of that trip in the show notes for this episode or on the website, uh, but you should be able to access it in your phone if you're using that to listen. Just take a look at the show notes and you'll find a link, and that will give you a day-by-day itinerary of all the places that he's going to go. And I just want to encourage you that if you haven't been to the Mediterranean, whether to Israel, to Egypt, to Greece, to Turkey, to Italy, these are the places that the Bible talks about. And seeing is believing. Going, you really get a sense of what it's like. It's just something that can't be conveyed in watching movies, in reading books, in listening to me talk about it. Certainly you can get some sense, but being there is just eye-opening. I know a lot of times people wait until their hair is gray and it's a little more difficult to get around to go on these kinds of trips, uh, which which is fine. I definitely plan on going on lots of trips when I'm older. But uh, I want to encourage you that are younger also who are listening to this. I don't care if you're a teenager, if you're in your 20s. I know it might be hard for you to get the funds together. But look, people buy all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, People buy video game systems, they buy brand new phones, they buy expensive football packages to watch games live. People buy all kinds of stuff, and I think this should be a priority. If you're a Bible person, if you're going to read this book for your life, which I've been doing for decades, I've been reading this book, I've been understanding it, I've been learning, and when you read it, you imagine in your mind, you picture in your mind, you visualize what's happening, right? So how are you going to visualize that if you've never seen the places that it talks about? You can still do it, of course, right? But you'd be amazed at how different what you imagine it looks like compared to what it actually looks like. Anyhow, I would recommend if you're young, save up for this trip. And and if you're a pastor, ask your church board, ask your elders, ask your family and friends to uh, contribute to you because As a pastor, this is really one of the absolute best things you can do for your understanding of the Bible, for your teaching ministry, and for your church for decades to come, is to go over there, see Ephesus, go over there, see Athens, see Corinth, see these places, experience the sun of the Mediterranean. See the kinds of trees and the kinds of rock. I mean, everything plays into how you visualize once you start reading the Bible after you get back from this kind of trip. So anyhow, I don't don't want to go on and on. This episode is already crazy long, so uh, what the heck, right? But I encourage you, whether you're young, whether you're middle-aged and you're in the throes of raising children like I am, or if you're older and you have a little more freedom— Uh, to go on this trip uh, and other trips like it. Uh, This trip doesn't do Israel, but it's going to hit 
so much of Turkey and Greece that show up in Paul's epistles, in the book of Revelation, in the book of Acts. And let me tell you, you are never going to be the same. So I just can't recommend that you go on trips like this enough. I think it really is, especially if you're American and you just have not been outside the country. This will really change your life in so many ways. So take a look at that trip coming up. We have gotten in a couple of new reviews on Apple Podcasts. Thanks so much for that. I'll probably just save those for next time and read those out later since this episode is already so long. So I think I'm just going to leave it here for today. If you'd like to support Restitutio, you can do that on our website, restitutio.org. Thanks for listening all the way to the end. You're really to be commended. You're just a superstar. Thank you so much. I'll catch you next week. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.